episode, we talk about freelance to full time, what I do when I'm traveling, and Meerkat and Periscope, what wins on those things. You ask questions, and I answer them. This is the Ask Gary V Show. I love this idea of like color, it's the show, black and white, it's not. Cool. Cool. Um, Can we start it with this too? Like with this? They can see they can see this this is how it went down. Yep. Like this is in it? One hundred percent. Uh all right. Uh hey everyone. Just gonna hand this off. No trimming. I'm just going it's until I shave it outright, it's just gonna be angry. (laughs) <laughs> just angry. You got this too? Yeah? No. I think, uh, I think it's good thing. All right. You got it. Oh, I think it's Gary. 88. 88? Ready? Yep. What's up, everybody? This is Gary Vaynerchuk, and this is episode 88 of the Ask Gary V Show. 88, a great number for me because I'm a huge fan of Al Toon. One of my favorite players of all time, probably my favorite Jet of all time. Like push comes to shove, I think I would go with Altoon, number 88 of the New York Jets. Just a smooth wide receiver that I enjoyed in my heyday of my youthful Jets watching, uh, getting excited for football. I have decided I'm going to the NFL draft and that gives me a solid opportunity, I would say a high probability of being the face of the Jets draft pick because this is in Chicago now. There won't be a lot of people wearing Jets jerseys like normally in New York. I and AJ will be doing that. And so uh, look for me on NFL Network and ESPN.com on draft day because I fully expect to make an appearance and we'll see how I react to the sixth pick in the draft. Um, Excited about the show. India was sick yesterday. Um, She's feeling slightly better. I appreciate the hustle of working through that and not being soft India and staying at home another day. A uh, little bit of switcheroo, Stefan showed D-Rock. D-Rock not <laughs> behind the camera. Is this a, is this a training in process mm-hmm. in case you ever got sick? Yes, I like that. Let's get into the show. John Luke asks, this question really got me thinking. When do you shift from hiring a freelancer to hiring someone for full time? Jean Luc, easy question. It's just easy. Um, There's really a couple of scenarios. Number one, the moment you fall in love with them and you say you should join my team full time because we are gonna be great together. This will bring value to my business. Number two, when you have a necessity, when when your business is growing, whether it's a new client or you're selling more of your stuff that they're producing for or whatever it may be, your business has grown and now you have a tested employee that goes to full time. There's a third scenario when the freelancer is so infatuated and in love with your business that they're pushing aggressively to join the team. It may not be practical. You may not be able to fully afford it, but your intuition tells you that long term, you know, nine months from now, the ROI will start kicking in and I want to reward this person's passion around me so I'm willing to make a little less money in the short term for that relationship and that stickiness of the long game. Those tend to be the scenarios when you make the shift, Jean-Luc. Zach asks, what's your travel schedule like to and from the office? Car, train, Uber, walk? And how do you spend that time? Travis? Tra- no, Zach. Zach. I just thought Travis because of Uber probably. Oh. Zach? Zach, yeah. Uh, Zach, I, uh, I, am, I live on the Upper East Side. Um, our office is on 24th and Park, so on the east side, it's a straight shoot down from, uh, from Park Avenue. That is 90% of the time, my move in the morning. Uh, then I obviously travel a lot, so a lot of time it's to JFK or things of that nature. It's always in, in Uber or black car or taxi, so it's, it's, it's usually in a car. I'm sitting in the back, seatbelt on, safety first, what? I don't even know why I did a hashtag there. <laughs> <laughs> Safety first, what? <laughs> Fuck. Um, uh, <laughs> that is ridiculous. Um, I, uh, I uh, call my mom, uh, call Brandon, uh, check my email, check my Twitter, uh, look through my Instagram, 
that's really what I'm usually doing. It's usually mom or Brandon, uh, Brandon who runs Wine Library, to catch up on the day, to strategize a little bit. Uh, checking email, checking Twitter, looking through Instagram a little bit. Now, right now, checking my fantasy baseball team and the news around fantasy baseball. Uh, and then moments in time, right? Where, where check my nuzzle for news. Uh, and you know, in, a, in about maybe seven or eight days, I'll start checking the NFL draft news. That will go away. Then I'll um, get into training camp news. Uh, but for the most part, I'm uh, I'm fully in. Mom, Brandon, once you know, sprinkle in my sister there a little bit. But my sister and dad come more ad hoc during the day. Uh, that's kind of how I uh, do it. Brian asks. Gary, did you catch the Wired story on Walt Disney World's billion dollar magic band? How do you see this space evolving? What do you think about the necessity for these online, offline bridge technologies? Brian, um, I mean, you know the answer, right? Like, this is an interesting question because this is inevitable. Smart technology is going to eat up the world. Everything in the world will be smart. All of it. All of it. Your shirt, your pants, your underwear, your sneakers, your socks, the wearables, it's all coming over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, uh, it allows things that are physical to go so much further um, in the digital world. The layering that and, and the ammo that this gives Disney in that upfront investment is extraordinary. The recall, the content pushing out, the unlocking virtual things, all of a sudden now they can change the flow of the park. One of the things I'm fascinated by as a retailer and a thing that I don't think a lot of people think about is efficiencies in an airport or an amusement park or a retail store where you know there's congested area around Splash Mountain but you know there's other parts of the park where people aren't going. Well now imagine slapping some technology on a rock all the way in left field around the haunted house where that's the last piece of the band touching for you to unlock the thing. Now you're moving people there, less lines, more, less lines in front of food. All of a sudden people are buying an extra fourth of a hot dog on average. Got it? These are really fascinating business dynamics um, that I think will play out for Disney specifically. As for the rest of the space, yeah man, I mean the Apple Watch is going to be a game changer for one, whether it's successful or not. From what I've read, and I, don't, I have one on pre-order, this buzzing on your body, which is saving you time from looking at your phone, you know what I think about time, is super fascinating. It's gonna start, if it clicks the way the smartphone did, you'll start having people at scale with it. It's gonna be the next smart thing that kind of happened, the watch. It's just all coming. You're properly looking at it for your business. Everybody should be looking at it for their business if they produce stuff. And, um, and it's a space that I'm spending a lot of time looking at Vayner RSC for our investments because it's clearly, in the way that social networks and the maturity of the internet felt right to me in 2005, six, and seven, wearable, smart, Technology being infiltrated into everything we do. This cup from from you know India telling India that it, the coffee is getting coffee. The coffee is getting cold and drink up, kiddo. It's fascinating. It's all fascinating. When can we get the smart beard? <laughs> the smart beard is coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you to shave. When trim your shit, beard, Dick. <laughs> Gary Beard's gonna say, trim your, trim me, trim your shit, mother Jane asks, many of your jabs and right hooks reach your B2C audience. Wine and books, for example. But how does it impact B2B? Jane, my right hooks are not made for B2B, so you'll never see me tweet, hey, uh, if you have a business, I want your business at VaynerMedia. It's just not feasible for me, but my jabs do. My content, where I talk about my thought leadership or my, my, my ambition to be a thought leader or my hope that I'm a thought leader, uh, you know, the more I say things that are right, you know, somebody watching or listening right now to Ask Gary Vee, episode 88, I say something about smart technology that makes them say, yeah, they need that for their business. Hey, Gary clearly seems to be paying attention to this. Maybe I should talk to Boehner about doing some activations around it. Um, we have clearly benefited as an agency from my outward content as a gateway drug to RFPs or out and out handed the business. Um, so VaynerMedia has clearly benefited from uh, all of this and uh, you know, this is something I'm very passionate about for all of you that are watching and listening. It's super important to me for you to realize that you're always one great piece of content away 
from having your life change. Like, let, let, let's just understand what I mean by this. Um, it's no different than being an artist with a song. Everybody, like, everybody you know started off not being known and then had a song that changed their life. Every investor you've heard of that has done well and made lots of money had an investment, Twitter, that changed their lives. Um, content, though not to the level of Madonna or Chris Saka, right? Content has the potential to change your life. So if you love something, music, photography, running culture, diet culture, museum culture, like whatever you love, you have to understand, by talking to the world, even if one person's listening, all you need is that one person to share it, the pipes of social network get into motion. This is why I love Medium. Medium will handpick content from nobodies, not big followers, just a good piece of content, and that becomes a game. You're one piece of content away from what you want to happen, happening. Now here's the problem. Most of you are not good enough to make that content. And I, and I get it, like that was rough, and I'm like, and I apologize, but talent matters, right? Like, like baseball players that get discovered in Japan that come over to the US and make lots of money, they had to be good enough to be discovered. You know, th- the quality of the content you put out matters. Like you can't just be like, museums are nice. That's not gonna lead to you being the CEO of a museum. Do you understand? You've gotta be right. When I go out and put out content that says Instagram's gonna get bought by Facebook and then everybody says I'm an idiot and then it happens, I'm not an idiot. Get it? So, you know, the things, the pressure I put on myself to answer these five questions on every episode is these are historic. We're gonna look back at them. And if I'm like, wearable technologies have no chance, it's a fad, and then it happens, idiot. That wasn't my piece of content that took me to the next level. It was a piece of content that took me a step back. So recognize that we have the opportunity to win this game. Recognize the quality of what we say, what we produce, how we put it out there is the variable to that upside. John asks, which industries do you think will leverage Meerkat the best? Who is their target user? What do you think, Gary? So John, throwing Periscope in there as well, um, Meerkat and Periscope will be leveraged by a lot of people, but I actually think retail, man. I think QVC-like opportunities on Meerkat. Like, like I, uh, we're Meerkatting right now. How many people on, 200? Uh, 275. 275. You know, it, I could schedule a Meerkat, and I'm planning on doing this, by the way, in a couple of months, maybe a couple of weeks, where I'm gonna say from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm gonna do a QVC-like wine show, where I'm just gonna sit here and taste wine, and somebody, DRock, on the other end is gonna be like, this person has this, this person has this. Like, we're literally gonna do a live QVC. I think retail, selling stuff on live is very real to me. I'm a big believer in it. Imagine I'm meerkatting, then I'm tweeting or Facebooking links to the things I'm talking about. People are interacting, sharing links. It's just super fascinating to me. So, um, my big bet is that retail uh, will be able to take big advantages of it because it's the people that can really take advantage of what this is replicating. The reason I do well with business is I realize nothing really changes, things just evolve. Meaning, Meerkat and Periscope are just live television. What does well? QVC. What else does well? Entertainment. So maybe somebody can start an entertainment show. What else does well? Sports. So I could see a local minor league baseball team or you know, like there's just a, sports does well, right? So like you could start a frisbee league that you get people into by watching it and then sponsors will pay you. Backyard basketball leagues, you know, uh, the fighting that we, the hardcore fighting that you see on YouTube that gets me into the rabbit, I mean I waste no time on anything and even I once in a while get suckered into like street fighting on YouTube because the knockout is just so intense. You know, I would watch that on Meerkat. I would watch that on Meerkat right now. Like if two dudes want to raise their hand and fight, two chicks, I mean, you know, whatever, fight. I'll watch that shit, I'll pay 2 dollars to watch it live. So I think that anything that's live on television, Periscope and Meerkat have the chance to play in. That's where I see the upside. That's it? Yeah. Oh great, that was a good show, solid show, solid answers. Um, that's good. Question of the day. I wanna break it up into two parts. One, would you televise anything on Meerkat and Periscope consistently? And two, 
How much time in a 24 hour day would you allocate to watching something live on one of those platforms? Fascinating stuff, really, really interesting. Uh, By the way, on the record, even though I'm a big investor in Meerkat, on the record, still convinced in my body at this moment right now that live streaming is a very challenging sector and you know, to, in the debate of who's gonna win between Meerkat and Periscope, and I know I wrote about this, but I'm gonna say it again for the show, you know, neither feels equally as possible as one or the other and I still think that damn ghost in LA, Snapchat, is a wild card in this entire game. So, you keep asking questions, I will keep answering them with my beard. People focus on too many small details. Way too many people in this room are gonna spend the next 30, 40 years of their lives trying to check the boxes of the things that they're not as good at and that you're gonna waste a load of time in news.